GEW going on and a lot of assignments being due soon, so I appreciate you guys coming out. What's GEW? Global Entrepreneurship Week. So it's just all around the world, people are doing events and going to seminars and learning about entrepreneurship. And so it's not just at Ryerson, Global Entrepreneurship Week is all around the world. Really? What's happening here at Ryerson? At Ryerson, there's plenty of events happening. Um, so the seminar is all week. There's a, we have a, <coughs> if, you, if you guys are really interested, we have one on, posted up on the website. And we also have sheets available in the office. But and we're going to bring those sheets over here and hand them out to you because this is our target market. You guys are awesome. Come to the Global Entrepreneurship Week thing. Perfect. Yeah, so we have a fashion show day this week. It's already sold out. But um, other than that, we're going to get the calendar right now for all the other things. So we're going to, I, I want to start off first by um, introducing my team. So that was Chris Fatafora that just walked out, Chris Martinez and Cameron Bartlett. Okay, without these guys, we wouldn't be able to organize and run this smoothly as we can. Um, also, I want to introduce everyone to the expert advisors for today. We're going to start with Steve Gideon on the far left. If you guys could just stand up and just say exactly what your background is, what your experience is, and, and maybe uh, what you enjoy, why you like this. Um, hi, I'm Steve. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship here at Ryerson. I see a couple of my peeps over there. Good luck, guys. Um, Chris, you're back. Awesome. Can't wait to hear about it. Um, I teach the year-long capstone project in entrepreneurship. I've also started up over a dozen companies, venture capital firms, and nonprofits over the years. Um, and uh, I'm the faculty advisor for students in free enterprise. Thank you. Next to is Hi, my name is Lauren. Um, I'm his friend. You know. I am um, I'm a chartered accountant by trade. I ran a business for a number of years. So I started business a few years ago looking for a job, so he, he asked me to come. I'm a member of the Bryce and Angel Network, so if you guys are moving forward, we can push you to the team. Dean's advisory council, so if you want to complain at the school, we'll do with that. And we're having a good time. Dean's advisory council. There we go. Awesome. So, as is typical with us entrepreneurial types, I carry about five business cards. So I'll recap really quickly. Probably the most relevant, maybe, is that uh, I teach finance and technology evaluation to the MBAs on Tuesday night. So uh, maybe that's where Steve and I kind of run into each other. But, um, so if you uh, end up taking a graduate course, you can be run into me. Um, I am an entrepreneur. I moonlight as an entrepreneur in residence with the Mars Discovery District, uh, which is a great hub of activity for tech-based businesses. I'm part of the uh, founding management team for Transgaming, uh, one of <coughs> Toronto's foremost and most exciting digital media companies. Um, and that's probably the most, oh, I, I know Will because um, we have a mutual friend in, in a, in a uh, esteemed undergraduate professor here called, named Sean Wise. Sean and I have been in the uh, venture capital advisory consulting business together for several years as well. Uh, my name is Will Kate. Um, I've been an entrepreneur uh, for about uh, 20 years now in digital media startups. Um, do uh, digital strategy consulting. Um, Started a bunch of businesses uh, and now work as a venture capitalist with uh, Professor Sean Wise. So that's why I'm Thank you very much. Okay, so first we have today, we're going to have to start with Patrick. All right, so yeah, do you want to have those? Because we're going to get expert advisors so they know what our calendar is. Thanks, Chris. That's a good quote. I'm sure you'll find the head for us here. So my name is Patrick Daggett, I'm an RTA student. Um, not a business student, so my business terminology is a little weird. Please forgive me. Um, I'm a last uh, minute addition to this, so I don't really have a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, I could very easily do some mock ups and have a little time. Basically, my idea is to take some of the, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the term hyper local news, basically uh, leveraging the internet and user generated content to develop a news platform where. Uh, people can report their own news, and if it's a story that's breaking that people are actually interested in, we'll have a rating system where their stories will jump to the top of our lists, and uh, people can get paid for actually breaking stories that people care about. So when people view your story, uh, you would get a few cents uh, that would come from local advertising that we could sell on the platform as well. The advantage to this is that uh, there's no real 
solid platform for uh, local businesses to advertise on online. Uh, I think that there's a lot of money there, and uh, if you could make something that was very localized and personalized, so uh, maybe I should just start with the idea of the business as a whole. When you go to this web page, uh, you'd be presented with a map where there's a scale. There's like a circle drawn around the map, and you can zoom in and out. And whatever area is within that circle, that is the area from which news is aggregated to you from. So the idea of local news can be as local as your street, if you zoom all the way down, or it can be as broad as your city, or if you wanted to, if the network gets big enough, you could pull back and draw news from the entire country or the world. The problem with the world being, obviously, that uh, it's hard to get different countries on board, but it could definitely be a possibility in Canada. Um, there is already some open source frameworks for building sites like this. Uh, the main uh, developer for this thing is called everyblock.com. Uh, they take data from uh, public sources, so from governments, they take uh, health inspections, crime reports that are public information from uh, the police, and they combine it all into a site, much like what I'm describing to you, except it's only one scale, it's on a full city scale. So there's an every block in San Francisco, there's an every block in Chicago. The problem with these businesses and these sites is that um, they only present data. There's no personal side to the story. So people enjoy news because it has to do with how it affects them. What is it gonna, what's in it for me, basically, when they read a news story? Um, sites like EveryBlock kind of fail at uh, filling the hyperlocal news uh, demand because data isn't news. You need someone to personalize it. So by adding these like journalistic uh, monetary incentives to the public, we'd be able to drive data uh, and stories to be submitted to our database. Obviously, with a lot of pitches, there would be uh, some sort of a mobile platform that would encourage people to log stories and documentation on the go with their phone. Uh, this gives us um, an advantage over traditional news networks because we have reporters everywhere. If there's a breaking story and someone pulls a gun in Dundas Square, we'll have pictures and footage of it way before anybody else will. So the, the content is obvious. I mean, that, that you can see how you can aggregate content. Yeah. How do you make money? Talk about money? the business model. Sure. Specifically, not just say advertising. Right. You know, just, just talk about how you see that on Twitter. So uh, local advertising is expensive because you have to basically reach out to as many people as you can, but the budgets aren't necessarily there. By being able to say, I only want to advertise people who live within this block and who are searching for news specifically on a very small neighborhood, you can charge a premium for the advertisements, but you can also make sure that they only pay these fees uh, very occasionally when the right person is on our site and is ready to be advertised to. Um, this can be used or uh, leveraged in the opposite manner too, where you could have national advertisers paying like very small fees for blanket advertisement on a national level. Um, the idea is that these advertising dollars would be shared between the company itself and uh, the people who are writing the stories that are most popular. And is it being done, is there a comparable model in some other city if you're starting here in Toronto, right. I assume, is there somewhere Every else? Every block is pretty much the closest. Right. Okay. Um, if you check it out though, basically it just depends on data. There's yeah. no actual right. uh, stories being what, created. What prevents them from doing that? Uh, the, the technology hasn't been built to okay. to collect. But that, would, that would be the barrier between what you want to do and what they're doing is just them adding the they would need to, to develop the technology. To aggregate the content. Exactly, but there is also an advantage because this uh, software is open source, but we'd be adding it onto it. Um, we might be able to, depending on the usage of it, we might be able to convince the CRTC that uh, this business is not uh, applicable for foreign ownership if it becomes like a standard in use. Uh, if we start to depend on it and it becomes like a main source for news in Canada. How much do you know about Now Public? Now Public? Yeah. I never heard of it. Uh, now Public <coughs> is the largest news agency in the world. And they just sold to uh, American. And uh, Now Public was started in Vancouver a few years ago, which is precisely what you're talking about oh, now. Okay. Um, and I know the founding team, and I know some of the core members of their staff. And um, it's a very difficult way to make money. Um, Problems. You end up having basically having to hire people to write, even though you want to crowdsource the news. You end up having to hire semi-professionally hire journalists on a contract basis right. to get the news you want. Um, the local advertisers. 
investors um, really aren't comfortable dealing with a sort of a new brand. So even the advertisers that do want to advertise online would rather buy, would rather do with Google than a new company. And um, it just it's really difficult to build that sales force to sell you know, to all those little local places. So it sounds like a fun project. I think you'll have a much harder time making a money making business out of it. Do they have a, is it like an incentive program where they like try to push people to write for the? They do it mostly based on reputation. So people are writing for them because you know, they want their stories covered and things like that. Um, but they ended up later on sort of hiring people on contract like who were sort of laid off journalists in different cities to you know, cover the Mumbai week or whatever. Right. Um, and uh, you know, I think it, it, it was really, it's tough to make money in that business um, just because there's so much everywhere. You could go to Now Public or you could go to YouTube. You know, you could go to Now Public or you could go to sort of like Twitter or anything. And uh, the traditional media is getting better at pulling up those things from you know, the ground, um, people's cell phones, things like that faster. So the sort of delta between what citizens can report and what journals can report is shrinking. Right. Um, we've sort of made it more and more difficult over time. Um, you know, what I find interesting is, uh, you guys remember um, Rachel presented this as her business idea, right? When she presented it, I thought, there's absolutely no way. When you presented it, I think, wow, I can see this actually happening. So, um, you know, you're a good, you're a good presenter. Um, what's your name again? Patrick. Um, can you pull this off? Like, how would you make something like this happen? Like, do you have friends that can program the sites, or? Yeah, I, have, uh, I have a couple of friends who are taking computer science in Waterloo. Uh, right. They're just graduating. Uh, but I would also need some more resources that way. I would need computer science students who can uh, do Python and MySLQ. Those are the two technologies that all of these sites are kind of uh, have a backbone to build with. OK. Um, I, I consider my strength in domain knowledge. He's an interested participant, sorry, I'd cut you off. He's an interested participant in DMZ also. So that's why I came today when he wants to try to apply to the digital media zone. Well, that was going to be that was going to be one of my suggestions as well. Yeah. Um, well, you know, part part of our job as as experts are to give you our, our opinions on things, but part of it as well too is is to suggest what you should specifically do next. So um, it seems to me that the, the the kinds of things that you don't quite have your mind around yet, or that you haven't presented to us. Is, is what the website itself is going to actually be built on. Right. And so any kind of details you've got around, you know, whether it's Python and SQL, I'm not completely sure that that's the right answer, but that's an answer, I guess. Okay. Uh, you know, so fleshing that out. Um, and do you know what a CPM rate is? Yeah. It's, okay. Uh, the rate that you charge for per advertisement online. Exactly, yeah. So if you could crunch some numbers related to, you know, within this region, we think we'd get, you know, a certain number of M. Right. And then you know, here's what the CPM we think we'd be able to get. So because of that, here's our first target audiences. Because you got to start someplace. Yeah. You can't start on a global basis. You got to start someplace. Yeah. So it might be nice to crunch some numbers. Um, but I would suggest that you do apply to the DMZ. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, what, do you think this has hope? I think it's a fun project. I think, it, I think building a business set is really, really tough. Having worked in the local search market. Um, the, the local advertisers who do end up spending money mm -hmm. usually come down to um, like taxis and escorts. <laughs> well, well, one of the nice things. Thank you. Yeah. So what I, I, I mean, I, I think Will's probably right. What, what I would do is I would, if you're going to do it, uh, make sure you do it on the cheap yes. and, and not spend not not spend a lot of hard dollars. Just spend your time. Because what's valuable about doing that is you learn what it takes to grow, to start and grow a business. And you gotta do it once, or twice, or three times. You gotta, you gotta understand at various points in time what are, what are the things that you're gonna run into. And you're gonna make mistakes. So, you know what, the earlier you start, and I'll, you know, I almost hate to use this line with, on the first presenter, but the sooner you start, the more mistakes you make. But when you hit the right thing, you're going to be, you're going to be, then you can be clicking on all cylinders, right? And so it's nothing wrong with a project. 
There's not, absolutely nothing wrong with that. Because the reality is if it actually works and takes off, you're in good shape. The downside is nothing. Down, there is no failure in, there is no downside in failure. Because you're gonna learn a ton, and the, and the least expensive you make that failure in terms of hard dollars, the better, right? Learn what it takes to attract advertisers. Learn what it takes to sell you know, to, to the right kind of market. All You can sit in a business class or sit at home and develop a business plan until you get on the street and do it, you have no idea. Right. The real world is totally different than what you're going to write in your business plan. Learn that. Learn all of that. In some cases, in your case, I wouldn't even write a business plan. You know, I'd get together with your group and say, let's go. Yeah. Right? And, and not have any illusions about what this is. We're just going to try to become entrepreneurs and learn the hard way a lot of those issues. And, and, and because I think you've got, this is the time in your life when it's the least costly to do that. Yeah. Well, the nice thing about doing this through the DMZ as well is that um, if you do this from a Ryerson base, then you're going to get all the journalism students, all the broadcast journalism students. They can potentially get course credit for uploading to your website. Uh, you know, the people, you'll let people vote on which ones they like. And so if you're the most highly rated journalist, you get to put that on your resume. And so rather than having to pay people to post news, you got your buddies in the program posting the news. And, you know, because it maybe, you know, the, the start of the circle is here at Ryerson, well, you got 20,000 Ryerson students that are probably going to be looking at it, and you can kind of sort of promote it through Ryerson. That gives you the M on your CPM rate. Hmm, this is starting to smell like you can at least start it. What I would suggest you do uh, on, on top, so I'll definitely start it, but if you can turn it into a buzzword here, scalable platform, yeah. so that now what you do is you franchise the platform out to somebody in, let's say, Guelph, and you get you know, a group of people that they're going to make a profit on your website because they're going to sell to the local people, and they're going to get the local journalists, and they're going to, and then you get some you know, lady in Guildwood who's really into this, and she's going to sell to her, and you find a way for them to make money on your website, then you become an eBay. Right? I mean, even, there's 100,000 people that make their living buying and selling on eBay. Right. Now that's a powerful business model if you empower other people to make money. Um, this is not my space. You know, probably, yeah, I am aware of you, including you. Um, but I was listening to what you're saying about this now. One thing you'll learn is entrepreneurs love to talk. People that start businesses love to talk. Go talk to these people. Find out what they're doing, how they're doing. Just keep talking. You'll get there. And, and you'll find out what you start at today is not where you end up. You'll get, a, you'll get, a, you know, you'll get something. Um, but I would definitely go to the, use his connection, go talk to these guys, talk to them on, on, you know, give them a call. How did it go? How did it, how did, there's a reason they're not here. They're not here, right? They're not in Toronto? They're in Vancouver. But they're not in Toronto. So they're not in Toronto. Yeah. So that says something. Right. There's, there's a clue. They're in Vancouver, they're starting, they're doing something. Maybe they want to be in Trump. Maybe they want to support you to be in Trump. Right. Maybe they'll tell you what went wrong, because they will. Right. Okay, and, and use his advice. That's, that's what I would think. Yeah. Go I, for it. Can I just ask one more question? Yeah. Um, just how much time do we have for questions? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have a uh, uh, panel. Okay, so what would the lion do to give us? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just a question about you know the, the local TV Matters campaign that we're seeing on the TV and like the lack of local coverage and television and how they're trying to get rid of that because there's no more funding for it. Do you feel like the market maybe could be heating up for ideas like this and they could come to a profitable... Uh, Potentially, it's unclear whether uh, local TV isn't doing well because it's not funded properly or because the market's just not there. It's, I, I, I can't get you a good answer on that. I don't know anything about it. I just, yeah, that was, that's kind of where I'm coming from because I feel like that need, although it may not, the demand might not be huge, there it is in Alaska. People need to know what's going on around. It, my, my sense is that if something happens, if people find a way to communicate, which is what Will was trying to say. There's lots of current mechanisms for you know if, to find out. You know, it's not as organized as you want to make it. It's it's chaotic, but that's that's where innovation happens. Is you know, people if something big happens, man, it's going to get communicated. It's going to get communicated across a number of of channels. Right. I just, uh, just want to add, that I forgot to mention this, one of the key features of the website is that although uh, reporting and posting will be anonymous, each username 
and story would have its own credibility and relevance rating that people could mark up or down. But you have to realize that you're gonna compete with every other digital media channel. Right. You'll compete with Twitter, you'll compete with Google, you'll compete with Now Public, you'll compete with any other, you'll pe compete with the local news and TV stations. Right. Right. You, you, this is, you're, 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 that's what you have to remember in all of this. Is that story that breaks on a blog or in a, in a, in a region, is going to is going to spread across as many channels and video channels, especially YouTube, anything with pictures. So that's your competition, not only for your writers and contributors, but also for your viewers, comes across a bunch of existing channels. And so right. that's the one thing you got to realize is that you're not going to be able to corner that market. You're going to have to try to differentiate how you present the content. Is it just the, so just the presenting of the content is where you need to, I was feeling like we could build a database of like journalistic integrity when you have people who post oh, sure. stories regularly. Well, possibly, but you still will compete with other presentation, right? Yeah. And people will aggregate content around some of those other channels, like whatever their preference is. So if they're not posting to your channel, they're gonna have their own channel. And, you know, there's lots of them out there. Um, can I give you a comment? I think you present very well. Thank you, very you, much. You, you, you've got your subject matter. Whether you're right or wrong, when you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't make any difference, right? You've got confidence. <laughs> Don't start another presentation by saying, I'm not a business student. Don't be apologetic. Yeah. Come with what you want to come with. And don't say, I didn't do this because I'm not this. That was the first thing that came out of my mind. I went, oh no, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna, this guy's not prepared. Right. But you were prepared. Yeah. Okay, so have confidence in who you are. Don't say, I'm a, I'm, I'm a journalism student and I didn't do this. I'm a journalism student and this is why I'm doing my presentation today. It's okay. different and it's better. Thank you. Okay? Good job. Thank Good job. You. Thank you.
So the invention is the device on how to use the dry ice, right? Correct. Yeah. How long will that uh, bucket of dry ice last before it um, melts? Yeah, that's the issue with this invention. So with dry ice, um, stuff disappears, it sublimates. Um, yeah. A bucket like this will last maybe 12 hours. If you don't use any of it, you just keep it in the open. Or even if you just cover it like that, 12 hours, you know, it'll disappear. So there's this, this supply chain issue with the dry ice because you can't really keep inventory of it. Mm -hmm. So once you do find a customer for these sticks, um, it's constantly having to resupply them with dry ice. And that's part of the business model. But um, Isn't that where the money is? Yeah, sure, it's, it's razors and razor blade. Is. You give them a little gizmo for free. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you give them a contract to deliver dry ice on a day-to-day -day basis, and you bring it to them at 6 o'clock just before yeah. they open up. Yeah. So help me out. Who's going to use this? Bars, nightclubs, Chuck E. Cheese, medieval times. I, I think it's, I think it's medieval times. <laughs> Have you spoken to them? It's so hard to get in touch with anyone when you're no one in the beginning. Uh, we were all nobodies once. <laughs> Some of us still are. <laughs> okay, okay. You, want to, you want to make a living at that, right? And you want to make your, your fortune. How much do those things sell and cost? I'm still working at the, About the, the cost issue. Of my yeah. I'm starting the manufacturing right it's now. It's an extruded thing, about 15 cents, right? More than that, because uh, it's the limited production run right now. But once I do scale up, hopefully I'll get to that level. Right. How much now? I can't really say right now. You don't know? I don't know. I bought a quote for the mold, and I'm having a mold manufacturer. Um, it's just narrowing down the type of material. It's an FDA type of material that's food safe. Right. But does it actually cool the water down? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. And it'll affect the taste a little bit, too. It does it affect the taste a little bit? It's CO2, so it's like what you put in. Yeah. The code. Is it like carrier? Yeah, yeah. It's like carbonated water. <laughs> Carbonic acid makes it a little citrusy. The problem is that solid CO2 is not used in bars today, right? No. Exactly. Okay, so how do you get that into the bar, right? Because you're right, if you'll buy that, you'll buy that. Mm -hmm. With this, you won't, you're not going to buy that. Because if you've got to charge them a buck for that, uh, make any money, and they're going to cost you 20 cents, that's what you've got to charge. So he's also got to get that CO2 in there in solid form. And how do you transport it? You can transport it by car. Um, I know with Canada, um, Road Safety Canada doesn't allow you to carry more than 500 kilograms of this stuff. Otherwise, you're a hazardous material truck and there are a whole bunch of issues behind that. But if you have less than 500 kilograms, it's safe to like carry in your own car. But um, this, this is the whole issue right here. Like it's setting trying to scale up a supply chain delivery system to get to every place in every city. So why don't you go to the party planners, the children's party planners, start there. Okay, there's all, to they, deliver this for me? No, no, to see if they'll bring that to kids' parties. Okay, they'll include it in their venue. And, and, and the party planners, the guys that do the bars, the, the bar, no? It's too much work. Well, go so to the nightclubs, I agree. They're in the same spot, you know where they are, they don't move from week to week. You know, you just get them up, you know, every Friday and Saturday night. Just talk to people. I mean, you know, it's, it's, uh, you guys haven't heard my lecture yet on why cold calling is good for the soul, right? It's good, you know, it builds character. Just get out there and say, hi, I'm a, I'm a crazy inventor. This is what I want to do. And it's, it's, you know, I've got this patent pending thing and, and sign them up. And, and if you talk to 20 people and they all say no, then, you know, keep changing your pitch. If you talk to 500 people and they keep saying no, then move on with your life. But we're not customers. I mean, it's that's uh, a that's a great suggestion, right? Yeah. Pick a couple of different target markets. I'm going to be the party pooper. I, I'd stay away from kids. Kids well, will yeah. kids will stomp on that thing. They'll open up the dry ice and stick it in their mouth. Then they get before troubles. before you can turn your back. That's true. Mm -hmm. You do you, If you've never had kids that are four and five and ten, my 14 year old would love to get into that and figure out what's in there. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm honestly, I I really be back to the whole hazardous, I mean, you said the wrong words, hazardous material in certain quantities, but that's because there's a reason, right? And secondly, somebody will break it open and do something stupid with it. 
<coughs> the first night they happen. And yeah, what happens the first time that happens at a club? I wonder. Yeah. And that's the one thing. So yes, talk to customers. Virgin, right? People, it's a prospect. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk to customers. But it wouldn't hurt. Yeah. And don't you know? Don't tell them that. Just see what if. See how many nightclub owners start thinking the same way. Mm -hmm. Some drunk stomps on it, sticks it in his mouth, and swallows it. You know what? What does this, this, this you know, how how big a risk is that? Ask them. Don't don't, don't just ask them for some ideas on how to use it. Mm -hmm. Ask them what they feel like they're expecting. You may as well you may as well understand that. I think all the nightclub owners are knowledgeable in that issue. Yeah. So. They're, they're, do I approach insurance companies and ask them how to pitch this? Uh, you can. I, I would assume anybody that can give you some feedback.